Good morning. Welcome to our lovely little announcement. There's lots of things to give you a really warm welcome this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's good, isn't it, to meet together with the worshipping Lord God and to pray and to sing. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the blessings of the day. Thank you for bringing us here, that we're found in your presence. We pray, Father, through our Holy Spirit that you would speak to us today. Change us, bless us, and make us to be your child. Amen. Let's stand if we're able and sing our first hymn this morning. Glory be to God the Father. <laughs> So announcements, not too many this week. Um, so obviously we have a Zoom this afternoon at four. I think I was very organised with the invites this morning. Surprised me. Um, so it'd be lovely to see you there if you meet online for a Bible study and prayer fellowship. Um, we have drop in on Thursday at seven. And again, opportunity to meet, to enjoy company. And then next Sunday, again, our service is at 11 o'clock with the children. We're going to uh, turn to our reading this morning, and we've come, we've come to a new chapter of uh, John's Gospel. It's John chapter 17, and the more, and it's a really famous passage, and the more that I, I looked into it and studied it over the last, not just the yeah, last week or so, um, I found some interesting quotes about this particular chapter. Um, in the Bible that I'm using, it's entitled, again, it wasn't in the original, but it's entitled The High Priestly Prayer. Uh, and one of my favorite quotes that I came across was by a, an old Scottish minister uh, by the name of John Brown. He wrote this. The 17th chapter of the Gospel of John is without doubt the most remarkable portion of the most remarkable book in the world. 
have to say something. Let me do that again. He says, the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John is without doubt the most remarkable portion of the most remarkable book in the world. So no question. So let's, uh, I'm just going to read the first five verses. It's uh, uh, John chapter 17. I'm going to start reading at verse 1 through to verse 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world was. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we... As we come before you, we are grateful for uh, the Bible, your word that you've left us. And as we see here this morning, we will spend some time, Father, looking into the, the prayer of your son. Pray, Lord, that you will teach us from it, that you will help us in our lives from it. Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for what he accomplished here on earth and his obedience to you, the Father. And we thank you too, Father, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the encouragement he is to us. Thank you that he helps us to understand. Lord, we, we come before you, we admit we struggle with this book, the Bible, some, well, often because we find it difficult and confusing, Father. But we thank you for the Holy Spirit as he opens our eyes and our understanding to the truths that we read there. And Lord, we pray this morning that that may be the case, that as we look at in it together, we will be encouraged together. Encouraged to worship you more. Encouraged to put you at the very center of our lives. Father, you are our God. We thank you. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we come before you, we pray for those who don't know you, for those who are unsure of where they stand before you. Lord, for our, our friends and our families, our loved ones, our colleagues. And we pray, Father, that you will draw them to know the Savior, that they will come in and learn to love him and accept him as their king, as their Lord, and as their Savior. Father, we pray for this part of North Wales. We thank you for the great blessings that you have bestowed uh, upon this land in the past. We pray, Father, once more that through the Holy Spirit you will do a, a mighty work again. We thank you for the, uh, for the party in heaven when one Christian, uh, one sinner, repents. Lord, we pray for many more to come to know you, Savior. We continue to remember those in conflict around this world, those in Ukraine and Russia, Lord, those in the Middle East and other parts of the world too, Lord, for those who are struggling to see uh, natural disasters and maybe man-made disasters. Lord, we see such pain and agony and, and wrongfulness on our, on our TVs and in our news feeds. So, Lord, we do cry out to you for your mercy. We pray for your patience. Lord, we pray that you will overrule, that you are sovereign, that through these things that are happening, many more will be brought in. We think too of those in authority over us. We pray for the, the Welsh Assembly, Lord, and, and those who are asking to, to do their best to, to serve this nation. We pray that Parliament too, Lord, we, we realise that many of the things that are discussed and passed as law are contrary to your word. So, Father, we do pray for your, your mercy and your forgiveness. We pray for those who are Christians, Lord, that you will help them to stand firm, to stand up for what is right and what is true and right. Lord, as we pray that for ourselves, we pray that you will give us the right words at the right time and to know when to say something, Lord, and know when to keep quiet. Because, Father, ultimately we want your name to be lifted high and glorified in our lives, in your church, in this village, in this land. So we pray now, Lord, that you will be with us, that you will bless this place we seek to worship Jesus Christ. Amen.
before we come to the, the sermon, let's stand, shall we, and sing our next hymn. I will glory in my Redeemer. When you, um, when you get to, to read the Bible and, and read through the Bible, you'll come across at times um, prayers that have been, let's say, written down for us or, or glimpses of prayers through lots of different people throughout the, the Bible. The very, very first, let's say, it wasn't a sermon by any means. It was, um, it was a talk I had to give at um, our Bible study in my old church because I had shown an interest that I wanted to preach, so um, as part of my, I don't want to say interview, training, I had to give a short talk, and I, I spoke on Nehemiah chapter 1, and there's some prayers in there that are amazing, different types of prayers. And, and I don't know when, about you, but when you read some of these prayers, sometimes it feels like we're almost, almost intruding. You know, this is a, a private moment, perhaps, between that person and God, but they're recorded there for... Well, for our benefit, ultimately. And when we get to the Gospels, we often read that, that Jesus would, would go off and pray. It happens a lot. And we're not told often what he is praying about, but he spent a lot of time just, just removing himself from the, from the hustle and the bustle and going to pray. And sometimes, yes, sometimes... We can read short snippets, if I can use that term, of his prayer. But here, here in, in John chapter 17, just hours before Jesus was arrested and then on to be crucified, we get to eavesdrop, is that the right word? Eavesdrop on his prayer. And actually it's the the longest prayer that's recorded in the New Testament. And as it's recorded for us, 
then it must be of some spiritual, let's say, some spiritual use to it. You know what? It must be must be worth us reading it and looking at it together. And actually, this this prayer of the Lord Jesus teaches us about prayer. Firstly, it teaches us what Jesus prayed for in these verses, reveals his his intense commitment to what? To glorify the Father, to glorify God. And that comes across again and again. The hymns that I've picked hopefully have all got that theme about glorifying God. Secondly, um, it reveals his, I've got the word indomitable, I'm not sure if I struggle with indomitable, but his indomitable compulsion, his determination, if you like, to accomplish the Father's work. And thirdly, it reveals his, his intimate communion with the Father. So those really are the, the three ways I'm going to split up these five verses this morning. So firstly, it shows the Lord Jesus showed an intense commitment to glorify the Father. And that's evident in his prayer. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. And, and this commitment to, to glorifying the Father should be the very heartbeat of prayer. It, 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 it aligns us fully with God. Now, I remember um, I often speak about growing up and my dad was a minister and growing up and all the things that I had to do, that I didn't like doing, like memorizing Bible verses when I was a kid, but actually it's well worth it in the long run. And sometimes we would, um, we would have to learn. I don't know if you come across it. It's a shorter passage. Just my I take my glasses in. I've got the right word now. What are they called? Oh, I'll get this. Yeah, catechisms, where where you get asked a question, where you ask a question, um, and there's a whole series of them, and then there is a an answer to that question. And I suppose one of the most famous ones of those questions is, what is the, or what is it? What is the chief aim of man? So if I was, uh, well, I'm not expecting you to answer, but if, you know, the answer to what is the chief aim of man, the answer that we all have to learn as a child and as we grow up is this, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And and as children, we, we learnt these questions, probably the only one I can remember now, it's my shame. But, you know, what is the chief aim of man? The chief aim of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But have you ever considered what the chief end of God is? It's an interesting question, isn't it? So I thought about that, and I came across this. It's not from the, the shorter uh, catechism, catechism, but someone has put it this way. I think it was a Puritan, not surprisingly. And he said this, God's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him. That's to say that, that everything that God does in the world, especially in his work of salvation, he does to further his own glory and enjoyment. Jonathan Edwards puts it like this, not the tickle bit. He put it like this, all that is ever spoken of in the scripture as an ultimate end of God's work is included in that one phrase, glory. Everything to the glory of God. And if we can only grasp this truth well, we'll be able to see that our greatest fulfillment in living, let me say that again, our greatest fulfillment in living is to live for him. Friends, real joy is not found in living for itself, as the world claims, but in living for the glory of God. That's that's what we were made for. That's us, if you like, fulfilling our, our true purpose, our true aim, our true mission. I suppose in one way this morning, you know, we could all check our own commitment to glorifying God. Perhaps we could try in our heads and our hearts at least asking ourselves the question. Do we have the same attitude as John the Baptist? 
Well, this is what John the Baptist said in, in John 3.13. Talking about the Lord Jesus, he said, he, that's Jesus, must increase. And I must decrease. That's giving him the glory and not ourselves. In 1 Peter 4.11 tells us that, that God must be glorified in all things. He must be glorified in our worship. Everything that we do here in our service must be directed to bring glory to him. Not to the preacher. Not to anyone else for that. God must be glorified in our service. And we can't allow any thought of, of self-glory or pride to come in and rob God. So not only that, not only he, God must be glorified even in our ordinary, might be boring, but our ordinary daily activity. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory. And therefore, if we are intensely committed to glorify God, everything that we do in life should be done with, with that aim, with, with that goal, his glory. One of my favourite talks, I think I probably preached it here many, many years ago, I think it was a few ago, um, was looking at the beginning of the Judges about um, a guy called Shamgar, yes, I know, not the racehorse, but Shamgar, he was a judge. We're not told a lot about Shamgar, he killed a lot of people with a, an ox goad. But the idea is that he just did what he could, he didn't do any more than he could, he did what he could with what he had, he had an ox goad. Did it to the glory. And that should be us. God's not asking us to do stuff that's impossible for us to do, but He's saying, whatever you do, the ordinary things that you do, do it to His glory, for His glory. And God must also be glorified in our praise. Now, if you think the last few phrases of the Lord's Prayer. So that's a different type of prayer. That was the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples on us, if you like, a, a model to use. But at the end of the Lord's Prayer, it captures it very well. It says, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and what? And the glory forever and ever. Do we really seek God's glory when we pray? What are our real motives for prayer. When we ask in prayer, what we ask for in prayer should, should ultimately seek God's glory. Even if the glory doesn't come in the way that you and I expect. When God doesn't answer our prayer the way perhaps we expect him to, it's only because his way brings greater glory to him. Think about Paul. I think it's three times it's recorded for us, at least in the in the Bible, that he prays for for the thorn in his flesh. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but for the thorn in his flesh, a, a physical ailment of some description, to be removed. And if God had had removed Paul's thorn in his flesh, then yes, God would have been glorified through Paul's health. But God didn't remove it. Instead, he left the thorn in Paul's flesh and gave Paul sufficient grace to bear the suffering so that the power of Christ could be manifested through Paul's weakness. That's the God that we serve. Often it seems to be the case, isn't it, that, it, that more glory is brought to God through, through a person's weakness through their health. God's ways, as we read in the Bible, is, is always so much higher than our way. He knows best how to derive greater glory for himself out of every situation. He knows how to 
how to derive more glory from himself through, through pain, yes, than through deliverance. He even knows how to derive much glory for himself by pain. And here in John 17, verse 1, Jesus prayed that God would glorify him. But how? How? Well, not by affecting a, a glorious rescue mission uh, from Jesus on the cross. In Matthew 26, 53, we actually are told that, that Jesus says that if he, if he had asked, the Father would have sent 12 legions of angels to rescue him. Right within God's right to have done that. No, Jesus prayed that God would glorify him by enabling him to endure the worst trial and gruesome suffering as he went to the cross and by accepting his personal blood sacrifice as an atonement for, for the sins of the world so that his death would not be in vain. How would all that bring, how would all this bring greater glory to God if he rescued his beloved son from going through all that? Displaying the love of God in a glorious way that had never been seen before. Romans 5, verse 8, brings out the, the awesome majesty of God's love that could only be shown at the cross. It says this, for God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. A few days before Jesus went to the cross, as he contemplated all the awful pain and suffering that he was about to go through, he said this in John 12. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Friends, we need to follow the Lord Jesus' example. Let us resolve to pray sincerely. Let us resolve to pray, may God be glorified in my life, in my strength, as well as in my weaknesses, in my gains, as well as my pains, in my gladness, yeah, also in my sadness. Make your prayer, make that your prayer, and see how it transforms your life. So we've seen that, that the prayer Jesus made in John 17 revealed his intense commitment to glorify the Father. Now, secondly, let's go on to see how that this prayer revealed uh, an inner determination, determined compulsion, if you like, to accomplish the work of the Father. And this is clearly revealed in, in verses two to, far, 2 to 4. God the Father had given Christ power over all flesh in order that he may accomplish a very important work, the work of giving eternal life to God's people. He is the eternal life giver. That This was the work that Jesus was about to accomplish very soon through his death on the cross. And so intensely driven was he by his, his determined compulsion to accomplish this, that in verse 4, he already anticipates, if you like, its full completion by saying, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you've given me to do. Actually, it was only actually accomplished when, when his full atonement for sin had been made when he cried out, it is finished. Every prayer that Jesus made reflected the same determination to finish the Father's work. Even when he agonized in prayer in Gethsemane, his prayer was this, not my will, but thy will be done. And this ought to be true of our prayers. They should reflect a, a strong desire. No, more than that. A compulsion, not for our wills to be done, but God's will to be done. 
That's why the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy will be done as it is in heaven. The accomplishment of God's will must always be the central motive of all of our prayer. Just as we should be, just as it should be the central motive for all of our living. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And in Matthew 12, 50, Jesus says this, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and my mother. John 4, 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his will. This determination, this compulsion for God's will to be done can also be seen in, in John Bunyan. We know John Bunyan from his Pilgrim's Progress and other books that we read. By his definition of prayer, he says this, Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the heart or soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit for, for such things as God has promised or according to his word, for the good of the church, with submission in faith to the will of God. If, if our prayers aren't made with submission to the will of God, then they may not be answered at all. That's what James wrote, James 4.3, You ask and you do not receive, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passion, not on God. If our prayers are made for entirely selfish reasons, such as satisfying our own lusts and desires, God, God won't answer them. Don't be surprised if he doesn't answer them. It only shows that what you want is more important to you than it is to what God wants. So the next time you and I pray, maybe make a point to listen to the Spirit. Think through. Yeah, think through and analyze our prayers to examine precisely what you're asking God for and why you want it. You might find that most of your praying is not for the things that you should be praying for. In the Old Testament, when Solomon, remember him, great king, all right. When Solomon became king of Israel, uh, the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said in 1 Kings 3, 5, ask what I shall give you. It's like giving someone a blank check, isn't it? He could have asked for anything. And the Lord would have given it to him. He could have asked the Lord to have given him riches or, or long life or, or victory over all his enemies or all those who oppose him. But all these selfish requests would only reveal that he is really unfit to rule the kingdom of Israel. So what did Solomon ask God for? He asked God for wisdom to know how to rule the kingdom well, so that God's people would get to enjoy all the blessings that God wanted them to have, you know, such as justice, peace, prosperity. And that's exactly what the Lord wanted himself wanted for his people. Here was a king at that time whose prayer was driven by a determined compulsion to accomplish the work of God's kingdom. And because of this, God gave him not only the wisdom that he asked for, but also all the other things he hadn't asked for. He was clearly pleased with Solomon's prayer request. And God will surely be pleased with our prayer request if it comes, if it gives the highest priority <coughs> to the work of the kingdom. Friends, God has a, a great work to accomplish in his world. And he wants to do it through you and me, through our prayers. Will you let your prayers be used to accomplish God's will? And then thirdly this morning, an intimate communion with the Father, the seat of our prayer. And it's revealed in at least two ways. Firstly, it's revealed in the way that that Jesus addresses God as his Father. In verse 1, he says, Father, the hour has come. And then in verse 5, and now, Father, glorify me. 
in the rest of the chapter, Jesus addresses God as the Father another four times, making a, a total of six times. And the actual term that Jesus used is the Aramaic word Abba. It's a, it's a term of endearment that a, a little child normally used to speak to his father. Uh, in the Talmud, says that it says that Abba was one of the first words that a Jewish child learned to speak. Even today, the Arabs still use the term Arab, so Abba, to refer to, to a daddy or a, or a papa. The fact that, that Jesus used this to address God in his praying shows how close his, his relationship, how close his communion was with the Father. We too can enjoy such close communion with God because when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he told them to say what? Our Father. And Jesus always also encouraged them to regard God, regard God as their Father. In Luke 11, he uses this picture, if you like, talking about God and his relationship with him. He says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly what, your heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And in these verses, they, they present to us the most heartwarming picture of prayer, a picture of a, of a loving Father who desires his children to, to gather themselves to him, to ask him for their needs. And he's happy to grant what they ask of him. If it's correct. Those of us who are parents can understand this a little better. How do you feel when your little child comes to ask you for help to do things that they can't do? I can't remember our kids doing that, sure they did. But I remember, still remember our grandkids and grandkids doing that. Hi, hi, can you help me with this? Granny. Can you help me color, color? Can you help me Bob? Can you fix that thing? Ty, can you fix that? Not Bob, Ty. And as, as our Heavenly Father, he, he loves for, for his children, for you and me who are his this morning, to come to him, to, to spend that time with him. Some may have wandered away for a time, like the prodigal son. And like the loving father in the parable, when, when the Lord Jesus sees any sign of them turning back to him, he is filled with joy to welcome them back into his presence. As our father, God wants his children to look up to him and to depend on him fully. He takes delight in hearing our prayer. Yes, he takes delight in our cry for help. He wants us to come to him often with childlike faith to express our, our full trust and, and confidence in him. And we can come to our Heavenly Father at any time, knowing that he will always be ready to receive us. This is the key. And so we've seen how, how Jesus has set an example for us with with the intimate communion he enjoyed with the Father. And also the Father. Another indication of the intimate communion that Jesus had with the Father is found here in verse 5. Here he asks the Father to glorify him with, him, with himself with the glory that he enjoyed with the Father before the world existed. The, the key position here, with, it's found tw twice in the verse speaks of intimacy. Before he came into the world, Jesus had been with the Father from eternity, always. As God the Son, he was equal with the Father in power and glory. <coughs> we then, we know he laid aside his glory 
and has sent into the world to accomplish the Father's work. And now, as that work was soon to be completed, he longs to return to heaven to be with the Father, to share once more the glory that he had with him. That ought to be our greatest desire as well. God made us for himself that we can never be fully satisfied until we enjoy intimate communion with him. In fact, eternal life is all about enjoying intimate communion with God forever and ever. It's brought out really well by Jesus Christ in verse 3, where he says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ of you, whom you have sent. And that word know in this verse speaks of the close personal relationship with God that man was made for at the very beginning. And it would take, or really would take, a, an eternity to fully, to really know God because he is infinite. There is no end to the knowledge of God. So we shouldn't think of eternal life merely being a, an endless existence. Everyone will exist somewhere forever. But the question is, in what condition or relationship will we spend them? If people aren't saved this morning, let me ask this. In what condition or relationship will you be spending your eternity? Without Christ, your eternity will be spent in complete isolation from God and from all life. And in complete desolation because of extreme pain and the very fires of hell. What a, what a terrible and hopeless way to spend it. Oh, but if you have Christ in your life, your eternity will be spent in the very presence of God, the giver of all life, and in the permanent bliss of heaven. And there, and there you will enjoy the most intimate communion with God that any mortal being can ever have. If this is how you want to spend eternity, then you must come to Jesus to receive from him. Jesus himself said in verse 2, that he's been given power over all flesh to give eternal life to as many as the Father has given him. But the question is, how can you tell if you are really one of those whom the Father has given to him? Well, the answer is this, by coming to Jesus. Jesus has already said in John 6, 34, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So don't delay. Don't delay in coming to Jesus for eternal life. Ask him to save you from your sins and from that eternal death. For those of us who are already saved, there's something very important to learn from verse 3. It's this, what is eternal life all about? That's what, we, that's what we're hoping for, isn't it? That's what we're looking forward to. If your concept of eternal life isn't like this, then you need to correct it. Some may think that eternal life is simply enjoying a better life up there. A life free from all the pains, and inconveniences we now experience. And that the way to obtain an eternal life is to know God. But if you read verse 3 carefully, you will see that knowing God is not merely a means to an end. Knowing God is actually the end itself. What does verse 3 say? And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is, is therefore a, a personal relationship with God through his son, through the Lord Jesus. And that means that if you're saved this morning, you should be already starting to enjoy eternal life. Here, now. You should be having a, a daily intimate communion with God through prayer, through reading the Bible. You should be cherishing every moment you can spend with your Heavenly Father in your daily devotions, in your prayers, and, and yes, in corporate worship like this morning, together with other Christians. Christianity is not just about getting saved. 
not just attended the first session, following a set of rules and regulations. It's about experiencing God in a personal way every day and growing in your knowledge of him. It's about spending the rest of your life with him. With the one who loves you more than anyone else ever can. You will no longer be afraid of death. Because you know that death is only a passageway, if you like, to the glory of being with you. As Jesus came nearer and nearer to the hour of his death, his thoughts were filled with the anticipation of being back with the Father. His heart was set on enjoying the fellowship and the glory that he used to enjoy with the Father. And as he prays in verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Oh, may we all learn to, to follow the example of Christ by looking forward to every opportunity that we have to commune with the Father. And may our prayer life from now on be, be characterized, character, characterized by an intense commitment to glorify God. A determination to accomplish his will by prayer and intimate communion. As we come to a close this morning, let's stand and sing for a moment. Sing to God be
praise, praise our almighty God. You are our heavenly Father. We thank you for the great joy and privilege it is to be able to call you Father. Lord, as we just spent some brief time looking together at this, this prayer for this, we, we are challenged and we need to open this up. Lord, we, we thank you for what we have. And Lord, we pray that you will help us in all that we do, in all that we think, in all that we say, to glorify you. Lord, you are the only one worthy of all glory. So we thank you and we praise you, our Father, in Jesus' name.